Okay, so why don't we get started? Um, I'm very excited about today's session. We have Quest Art School and Gallery here today, and uh, Virginia will be uh, talking about the connection between mental health and art, uh, something that I personally believe very strongly in. I know uh, Virginia does as well. Uh, today's session is sponsored by ADCO Tire, so thank you so much to ADCO for uh, making this possible. The entire uh, A Week to Be Well series, as well as this weekend's Get Your Mental Health in Motion fundraiser, are sponsored by a number of great local businesses, and uh, our title sponsors are Midland Honda and Brissette Concrete and Forming. So um, all of the sessions are provided for free. If you would like to make a donation to the COVID-19 Mental Health Relief Fund, uh, there is a link that's going to be provided in the chat. And uh, any donations that go to that will support uh, mental health locally and uh, the challenges uh, that uh, people have been facing throughout the pandemic and uh, some of the changes that we're going to be making here at the hospital uh, in response and in the community as well. So Virginia, I will let you take it away. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here today. Yeah, no, very happy to be here and happy to be asked uh, to participate in this. Uh, I think that the connection between art and mental health is so strong and so important and something that perhaps we don't talk about enough. And also just to let people know about the kind of resources that are out there within the community through Quest and other organizations that can help to support that. Um, there's been a lot of research that has been done showing the link between mental health and emotional well being and art. Uh, it's something that people tend to forget, but when we look at things like what we've just gone through with COVID and are going through with COVID, um, it was things like uh, Netflix and um, being able to do activities together, all of those different things that are all part of the creative spirit. And they are what help Get, help get us through those difficult and challenging times. I came across a quote recently by Frederick Nietzsche, the great philosopher, and he said, we have art so that we shall not die of reality. And I think that that really expresses that sentiment as to why we need art and the important role that it has in our life and in our overall emotional and mental health. Um, we know, and studies have proven, there have been studies out of Harvard um, University and other very, very well-known and well-respected organizations about how art does make you feel better about yourself. We know that creating art helps to boost self-esteem and gives a great sense of accomplishment in things. It also provides dopamine, which makes people feel good. It's a natural um, endorphin, and it helps to improve your concentration and also motivation. When you use your hands to create something and you feel good about doing that, it gives you mental health benefits. You will feel it immediately. Um, Different uh, conditions as well can respond very, oops, sorry, my cat, can respond very well to different kinds of specific art therapy. Uh, Alzheimer's patients, for example, respond very well to directed art therapy. It helps with their cognitive abilities and with their memory, both being able to recall memory and to keep memory going better. Um, Chronic, sorry, health conditions can be alleviated through the use of art. Um, often if people are dealing with chronic health, they might be also dealing with depression, with pain, with anxiety, with stress. And by being able to create artwork, whether it's something very simple, a little drawing or a painting or playing with plasticine, it helps to distract people from that. So it gives you a positive experience and a way of also expressing their feeling. Um, stress relief through health benefits is huge for children and for adults alike. Artistic activities such as sculpting, painting, and drawing 
all contribute to lower stress levels and mental calmness. Um, they help get your mind off of everyday life and provide relaxing distraction. Your brain also goes into a different kind of mental uh, kind of flow when you're creating art. It helps you to set aside your worries and focus on what you're creation, creating, which is really a positive thing to do. Art also encourages creative thinking and imagination in children and in adults. It's never, ever too late to try that. And it enhances your problem solving skills. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, the author said, to practice any art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, so do it. And we offer a lot of different programs through Quest that are actually specifically tied into the mental health benefits that art making provides. Um, we have been running a program for a number of years with the Hero Center, which is um, works with people who are transitioning out of care or um, getting sort of back more integrated into uh, our community. And we Midland Public Library is a partner on this as well. And so every Thursday they would come and it would be facilitated by different kinds of art therapists. And the participants got to create some amazing, amazing artworks. But even more importantly was it provided that sense of community. Uh, we run a similar program for the clients of community living. And in Midland, we have the only, um, the only program for Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers, which is also art-based theory or therapeutic art. We also do this with our exhibitions where we really allow those to try to stimulate different kinds of discussions and sometimes uh, even to be able to provide a safe spot for difficult or challenging conversations. Back in the winter, we had an exhibition called More to It Than Being Blue, which was dealing specifically with depression. Uh, there were five artists that were part of it. All of them had dealt with depression or were still dealing with depression. The artwork was responding to their particular stories and how they coped and was a great opportunity. We had, uh, partnered with the Waypoint Mental Health Center, with North Simcoe Youth Wellness Hub, uh, Shigamut, uh, other organizations, Mental Health in Motion. And throughout the course of the exhibition, we provided different activities that people could take, play, take part in. Everything from um, meditation sessions, to um, safe discussion groups, to creating mandalas. So it really was using art as that um, jettison point for being able to have bigger conversations about depression and mental health and how we cope and how we stay connected. The exhibitions of course uh, were up during the middle at uh, once COVID hit and we were stuck with not being able to be able to provide those sorts of programs uh, anymore because we couldn't have people into the building, which was unfortunate. But one of the things we are doing is rebuilding our Quest website, which hopefully will be ready to launch soon. And we are going to be having programs that people will be able to access online and for free for specific art activities that you can do to just sort of have fun, relax, um, take a break. We all need that break. We're really overwhelmed with a lot of stuff that's going on. If COVID-2, the second stage continues on, people are gonna be again back into lockdown. And it's really significant and very important to try to find things to keep that feeling of connection, of moving forward, and of being creative. And that can be as easy as coloring something, um, you know, going to the dollar store, getting a coloring book and some crayons and just coloring those in. You can also look for specific um, inspiration. For example, you might grab a piece of paper and some coloring implements and just look out your window 
close your eyes, take a deep breath, reflect on your day, and then look out the window again and find one thing that you want to try to capture to record, to have um, as a little expression of what you've been feeling. You might also want to do something where you're thinking about where your special place is that you feel safe and secure, or if you could go anywhere, where would it be? And while you're doing that drawing and that rendition, think too about things like what kind of sounds would there be? What kind of scents would there be? What is the weather like? Let your mind go and let creativity go. And another really helpful exercise, especially when people are feeling stressed um, and uncomfortable, is to really take that time and think about what makes you feel thankful. Was there something good that happened during the day? Did somebody say something kind to you? Um, just anything at all, but even just that one thing that makes you feel thankful and you record it with a little messy drawing or something colorful, it helps to create and keep that sense of um, thankfulness with you longer. And these are all very easy little exercises that can be done. Um, unfortunately, we had hoped to have someone to do a couple demonstrations for you, but uh, unfortunately that person became ill and uh, we're not able to have her with us. But what we are going to do is send on some links to some different activities that people can try out on their own. And then, uh, as I said, keep checking back on the Quest website where there will be more resources and activities for being able to do those sorts of um, mind uh, relaxer exercises. You don't need to have expensive um, art materials. You don't need to be accomplished. You just need to open up and be creative and make that connection happen. And I think you'll be very surprised at how good you feel afterwards. Any questions or comments? If anybody wants to add questions into the chat, uh, Virginia can see them there. And uh, I think we have a few that were emailed in as well. So we can also post okay. those for you, Virginia. I'll grab those in a second. Great. Oh, yes. So the question was, do we have any recommendations for children's activities? The activities that I will be forwarding on to you can be done by children, by adults, by um, senior citizens. It's all very uh, age friendly. And we are looking to, uh, well, we have been looking at being able to set up a few more classes for children, because again, parents are really looking for things for their kids to do. And little ones are feeling anxious about what's going on as well. Um, so we're keeping an eye on what's happening with the COVID, but we are hoping to be able to start launching some more classes for children's workshops that will take place in Midland and possibly in Penetanguishene. Um, the big thing I think too to say to do with the children is for the caregivers to try to work with them as well. Uh, to do, you know, a collaborative artwork is always fun. Or one of the things that is always kind of neat to do is to self portraits. So if you've got uh, a child that you want to do some artwork with, get her or him to draw you and you draw him or her. And then you can talk about what you, how you, do, how you uh, did the painting or the drawing and why you maybe emphasized certain things or chose different colors, but it just adds that extra level of interaction. And again, of you 
means of creating a conversation. There's another activity that I'll be sending along that actually involves painting with marbles. That's really fun and there's some activity and you can move around so you can get a little bit of physical activity happening with that too. Um, but anything that I will be sending on can be used for children as well as for adults. Um, okay, many, uh, okay, the one question throughout history, many artists seem to have personal struggles with mental illnesses. Why do we think that is? Um, it's a big question and there've been a lot of books and even courses dealing with that. Perhaps one of the reasons, maybe not necessarily that artists suffer from mental illness more than the, the non-artist population, but I think perhaps that by being an artist and in this kind of community, that it is more um, accepting of the uh, challenges that are faced as a result of um, mental illness. And I think other perhaps sectors or, or professions, it might be more challenging um, to be open and forthright about uh, mental illness, although I definitely think that's changing quite a bit. Uh, there's been talk to or research done into how different parts of the brains are stimulated um, and that perhaps out of certain um, diagnoses, uh, bipolar or schizophrenia perhaps, that there is also that ability to channel into that other um, realm of the, the imagination that then gets manifested in the artwork. Uh, for some artists, it also has been as a result of toxins from different um, paints, printmaking, uh, you know, tools. So it's, it's a big question and probably as many different answers as there are artists. Um, but it is something that definitely, I think the creative spirit is perhaps more open to being honest about what the challenges are. Okay, let's, we've got a couple more chat. Uh, programs available in our local schools and high schools. The, we're uh, fortunate the high schools have some really, really great art teachers. They're very dedicated, uh, very creative and look for a lot of wonderful opportunities for their students to be involved. Uh, usually at, with elementary schools, uh, same thing, Quest used to do a great outreach program where we would go into the schools and deliver core-based curriculum related programs. And we would also work with the teachers. So if there was something specific that they wanted covered, we would use our resources to be able to respond to them. Uh, and we always had this annual exhibition called High Art, which was uh, highlighting the, the artwork done by high school students throughout the um, community. And of course, now with COVID, we're obviously, we can't have the kids coming to the gallery for art classes. And likewise, we are not able to deliver the programs in person to them. So at this point, we are working primarily with the high schools, but we will be reaching out to the elementary schools as well about how we are going to be able to deliver programming for them, but keeping to the COVID guidelines and restrictions. So a lot of that will obviously be online and also really looking at what sort of things we can do with collaborations. So there is, and I think there is a question about public art coming up as well. And um, one of the projects that we are working on, that's going to be hopefully launched in June in Penetanguishene and hopefully in Midland around the same time, 
is a mural project. And so we will be working with the um, students that are going to be part of this. It is going to be about the one in Penetanguishing is looking at celebrating the Meite history of the area. We are collaborating with uh, GBDSS, with Shigamuk, uh, with the um, Georgian Bay Meite Nations Council. And what essentially what we will be doing is putting out a call as well for artists to be involved in this as mentors for the students, but they will be learning Meite history. The students will have that opportunity to be able to um, learn what is involved in putting together a project like this. So they are going to have that opportunity to learn project management and budgeting and how to do presentations and how to bring an artwork from conception to fruition into existence and the social role that artwork, public art can play within a community. And that's something that we're really looking to emphasize quite a bit in the education programs that we are in the process of developing. I think that through um, everything that's been happening over the last several months from COVID to Black Lives Matters to uh, you know, considering the homeless within the community, that social activist art can play a huge role in helping to uh, helping to bring those discussions to fruition and helping to stimulate the conversations. And art can give um, vision or can give visible substance to things that perhaps we can't um, articulate as well. There is the saying that a uh, picture is worth a thousand words. And one of the things that I think we want to really make sure of is that in the public art that's created, that people see themselves represented. Uh, in this area in Midland, we've got a number of murals that are quite lovely but they're very much from the colonist point of view. And we're not really seeing anything very publicly representing what the indigenous experiences and histories are of this area. And that's something that should be taken on. Um, there's also, and again, there is a question, so I'm just referring back to, um, to the chat that, Social um, social activism and visual art can play huge roles in bringing about change. I was mentioning, uh, or someone was mentioning about critical thinking and media literacy, uh, being able to tell what fake news is and to be able to go through different sources in order to understand what really is fact and what is fiction is uh, something that we really need to do more of. And there are a number of um, publications and seminars that we have been attending, myself and my audience engagement team and education staff, specifically looking at um, social justice, activism, and what we can do to address environmental, um, social justice, and health and media literacy. So those are things you're all going to be seeing coming out of Quest uh, over the next few months. And I think it's something that even the role of an art gallery or a museum is, the, we're really changing a lot of how traditionally museums and galleries have been run. And I think that it used to be that you were supposed to be very um, impartial, very nonpartisan. And I think with the changes that have occurred over the last while, we recognize that as places of 
authority or history um, and that serve communities, that that impartiality, that nonpartisanness doesn't necessarily work to advantage and that museums and art galleries do need to take positions um, on social issues that are so critical to our society these days. And how do you encourage creative thinking? Don't be afraid. Um, take risks. Try new things. Uh, and don't, don't be afraid is probably the number one thing I would say. People often overanalyze or feel like, oh, I have to be so good and it has to be perfect. Some of the best things in art that can happen can happen because they might be considered a mistake. Uh, you know, Bob Ross with his uh, instructions of saying, you know, there are, you know, that there's no mistakes. There's just more happy little trees. We get inside our heads too often. We hold back. And sometimes we just need to let it go and see where the spirit takes us. And if it you don't like it afterwards, you get rid of it and you do something else. But taking a risk, taking trying new things, not being afraid and not being in your head, I think are the big things and to look for other sources of inspiration to go out there to go to galleries to see what other people are doing to take walks outside we live in a beautiful area and just come back and say okay I want to try this or I want to capture this or um, one of the things that I have done when I've been mentoring artists sometimes and they're getting hung up on something and it's like I don't know how to get past it and I'll say just try doing something with your eyes shut because you're not going to be over analyzing it and again it allows for that um, opportunity to just sort of get out of your head and say okay I'll see what this looks like right now and uh, I'll give it a try next question Yes. Uh, okay. So the question is, can you speak to the role of art in giving voice to underrepresented groups or voices to those who have not been given the platform or have the ability to advocate for themselves? And I think that's a huge question. That's so important. It's actually speaking about that with somebody earlier today. Um, and I think one of the big things to, to put out there is if people don't see themselves represented in artwork, in galleries, in museums, people are going to assume that they don't belong. And traditionally, uh, if you look at who have been um, hanging in the, you know, art museums, there's uh, something like 97% of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection was male artists and white male artists predominantly. So if you are a young woman of color and you're walking through a museum and all you're seeing are artworks by um, you know, dead white guys or live white guys, you're not going to feel like you've got your, you're represented or that it is a place for you. And I think galleries and museums have not just a duty, but well, a moral duty, an obligation to reach out to anybody who is underrepresented or not represented in a museum or a gallery setting. And what the thing with that, though, is it can't be coming down with this sort of, well, we're going to come in and we're going to figure this out and we're going to make this happen. It is, you need to go to that community and offer resources, but let them tell you what they need and what we can be doing to respond to them. Um, I think hopefully some of the things that we have learned you know, nationally as going through truth and reconciliation is that there needs to be consultation. And this is not just with, uh, I, and I would say consultation 
with any underrepresented or challenged group about what their experiences are and what we can do in our role to support them in helping that and making that happen. Too often, I think what has happened in the past is someone at a gallery or a museum, perhaps with really good intentions, have an idea about saying, well, we should go out and we should do something with homeless or a particular community. And they come to it, that, that group saying, well, we want to do this and you know, this is how we're going to do it, but they don't have a dialogue. And consultation is not necessarily just because you might have consulted with somebody or with an organization. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've got the consent. And I think people need to be really cautious and aware of also not telling other people's stories or even filtering it through what is our, you know, what we feel is our experience. We need to, you know, respect that different people are going to have different experiences. They're going to want to do things differently. And it is not for the museum or gallery to say, well, we're the authority, we know it all. In fact, we have to, I think, be really honest and say, you know what, we don't know a lot and we need to learn. And I think you need to come at it from the position of humility. But as a galleries and museums, you know, we receive generally funding from municipalities, from provinces, federally for a number of them, and donations. And I believe strongly that that means that it is the people own the, these facilities. They own the museums and galleries. It's not meant for a few. It should not be meant for a few. And it should be accessible. And if too, that means that perhaps I did a project back when I was in the in Owen Sound at the Tom Thompson, and we were working with Nishinaming and uh, which is one of the reserves that's close by, and we wanted to run this one program, and we were told I was told in consultation that one of the big challenges for the elders to be able to get into Owen Sound was transportation. So I went out and found funding for a bus. And so the bus went to the two, el to the two senior citizens, the two elders um, community halls, both at, uh, at Sogeen and Kate Croker, and brought them in. We had refreshments as well, you know, good healthy food, apples and some juice and, and stuff like that. But they were able to participate and they could make it in. And it was our way of saying, you know, we're, we're not looking at what's convenient for us. We're looking at what can we do to make this accessible for you? And I think that historically there has been, um, there's never been enough consultation with uh, underrepresented communities. And with those who, uh, there was the second part to the question, um, yet yeah, with not having the ability to advocate for themselves, one of the things that we are building into our public, our program is, and we have guidance, we've got uh, some coursework and resources that actually were shared with us by a professor from OCAD that's specializing in this, is to be able to, again, have tools that we can share if, other communities are looking for those sorts of resources to be able to find the means to advocate. And I think that that's another important role that we have, and that is for us to support and be advocates for those communities. So it's changing a lot. The mu museum and gallery world, I think, is changing a lot. And I think it's changing for the better. And that will still always be, you know, uh, places for having beautiful objects to be able to contemplate and to learn about history and learn about community. But 
I think that it has so much more opportunity for taking on a stronger role as a community partner to do what we can with the resources that we have in sharing those and making our community stronger. Virginia, the um, Harvard Review, I think it was, had an article talking about the power of art, especially with seniors populations, um, looking at yes. loss. And um, I was wondering, do you guys have any programs uh, for seniors, especially uh, around topics of things like dementia? I think the article actually said that seniors who engage in art-based activities, as opposed to reading, which is still mm -hmm. a, a very positive thing, yeah. can have higher um, rates of retention of long-term memory afterwards. Exactly. I've read that article myself. And yes, we do have, uh, as I said, we were running live Alzheimer's and we did outreach to the seniors, pro seniors homes in the area. We actually last two summers ago, we ran this one great summer camp program, which I would love to do again, which was at the theme of it was my hometown, I think something along that line. And it was, we had a bunch of kids, I think they were around eight to 12 and they were doing drawings and paintings of their favorite places in like Midland Penetanguishing. And then we took that with the kids to one of the seniors homes. And then they worked, we paired up the seniors with the kids and they worked on completing that mural together. And it was so great. And everybody had so much fun. And it was lovely to have that cross-generational, um, but you know, again, we can't run those kind of in-person ones anymore because of COVID, but we are looking at what we're gonna be able to put online. So we will be continuing to do that. We're looking to have the community living, uh, the Alzheimer's and other programs that will be accessible online to the people that normally would be coming into the building. But I think there's also a good potential for us to be able to get it out there even to a, a far farther, um, a much wider audience. And one of the things that I'm also prioritizing is as much as possible programs that we are offering for those kinds of services will either be free or by donation or very, very minimal cost because you know, I would never want to have anybody feel that they've been precluded or they can't take uh, part, they can't take part because uh, a fee is a stumbling block. And we, you know, when we talk about underrepresented uh, you know, populations within our community, you know, we do know that financial challenges are, are very real. And um, the, the only way, you know, we're really gonna get through all of this is everybody collaborating and, and working together as much as we can. Well, I know um, the team here is very thankful to you and everybody at Quest for all of the work you've done to support our clients in the community and our patients in hospital. Uh, we feel very fortunate that uh, you guys have been such strong supporters of mental health and supporting our hospital and people that, um, require art uh, as that therapeutic avenue. So thank you very much. And Virginia, thank you for today. This was great. Good. Well, I'm, I was really happy to do it and looking forward to our continuing uh, collaborations. And uh, again, if, uh, I'm Virginia at questart.ca. So if anybody has follow-up questions, let me know. Uh, as I said, I'll put together a package, I'll send it off to Holly and Shelley, and that can be shared. And hopefully within the next week or two, we will also have things up on our new website that everybody will be able to access. Great. And um, again, thank you to uh, Midland 